Welcome back to Dragon Ball Dissection December, the month-long marathon of Dragon Ball Dissection videos. Merry Christmas to all who celebrate it. Thanks for once again joining me on my favorite holiday to discuss one of my favorite franchises. So last time, Goku had become the spectacular, possibly even legendary, Super Saiyan 4. And he took the fight to Baby, who likewise transformed into a golden great ape. Unfortunately, Goku had taken a bad hit last time, and it looks like Baby's in the driver's seat. However, before he can finish Goku off, Baby's body suddenly starts radiating ki for some reason. It turns out that the 10 times Kamehameha Goku had launched last time had a delayed effect on Baby... somehow. Get used to that. I think there are a lot in these final episodes that are exciting and momentous, but so many things are resolved because something happens somehow for some reason, and we just have to roll with it. In this case, it's particularly galling because, hey, that tense cliffhanger we ended on last time? Well, it turns out there was nothing to be stressed about, nothing for the hero to overcome. It was just going to resolve itself on its own anyway. The cliffhanger exists for no other reason than to hook the kids to come back next week, and those are the worst kinds. In fact, it's even worse than that, as the previous episode had set up the idea that something was wrong with Baby. The elder Kaioshin pointed out having seen something in Baby's eyes, something that possibly indicated that being a great ape was taking a toll on him. That's interesting. Where does that go? Nowhere. After a few more moments of fighting, the fracas temporarily concludes with a double knockout. It's nice to see one of those again, and it's the perfect time to mix in some narrative movement before the fight drags on too long. Like I said a couple of episodes ago, GT's pacing with this fight is one of its stronger attributes. The Elder Kaioshin seizes on this chance. He wants to heal Trunks and the others in order to give Goku more allies. Now, I didn't mention this before, but when Baby was fighting Oob, the other Saiyans jumped in to help Baby, something he didn't appreciate. Yeah, it must be tough to get the zombie slaves you control to act under your control. Anyway, Baby blasted them all away, and we haven't seen them again until the very end of the last episode, revealing they're unconscious somewhere. Kibito Kaioshin points out that healing them won't help, as even though they're not too in sync with Baby's desires, they are still loyal to him. The elder Kaioshin wants him to use the Cho Shinsui to rid them of their toxins first. Kibito Kaioshin has to exposit what this is to Sugaroku, as well as explain that it's located in Earth's heavenly realm. So naturally, after he leaves, he immediately teleports back to ask where it is. That's Dragon Ball GT! Their jokes are contradicted by exposition in the same scene. That said, I like this idea. Again, this is specifically the animated Dragon Ball continuity. I may not have been the biggest fan of the Garlic Jr. arc, but it is part of this story. I like that they're reaching back to it to solve their problems here. It sure would be a shame if Kibito Kaioshin accidentally grabbed the Cho Shinsui from the Piccolo arc and ended up killing everybody instead. I probably made the same joke when I covered the Garlic Jr. arc four years ago in DBD December, but if they can dust this off, so can I. There is humor to be found in Kaioshin sneaking around and having to run away from the possessed Dende and Popo. He can't find the right jar, so he keeps splashing the wrong water in their faces. Then at the very last second, he finds the right water. I mean, it's the last second in the sense that I assume he doesn't want to have to harm Dende and Popo. I have to assume he can. He's a Kaioshin. Eh, whatever. It's not fantastic. It could have been a little more inspired, a little less obvious in how it was going to go, but it works well enough for the fun little romp it is. It's certainly much shorter and much less tedious than the endlessly recycled shots of God and Popo running and jumping trying to disperse the Choshinsui on their adventure. So I can't really complain. I'm not sure where Trunks and the others ended up, but it doesn't look much like Planet Sufru. Whatever, we'll be here all day if I do this. And if I do that, I won't have time for the next installment of Somehow, for some reason. Bluma rushes to her satellites because she has a plan to get Baby back on his feet. She bathes him in more concentrated Bruce waves, which now also have the ability to recover Baby's health. Somehow. For some reason. Too bad Goku, who is right next to him, can't take advantage of that. Somehow. 
for some reason. The wave is right there. Still, Baby and Goku both recover. In fact, Baby recovers to find Goku waiting for him, as if he had never been hurt at all. And no, it's not because he caught some stray brute's waves. In fact, I was about ready to complain this is another pointless cliffhanger that Goku could have used this time playing possum to finish Baby off. However, this is just a ruse. As the gods point out, Goku is not doing well. He's clearly hoping this bluff will knock Baby off balance. I do kind of like that. Unfortunately, it's not quite enough, and Baby eventually has Goku at his mercy. During the double KO section, it starts to rain on Planet Sufudu, and I kind of wish that it continued for the rest of the fight, both to break it up visually and because it looks really good on its own. Alas, the rain stops as soon as the combatants wake up again. It's only symbolic rain, not the real stuff. Before Baby can finish off Goku, Pan jumps in, determined to save her grandpa, but ultimately unable to do anything. In fact, now Goku has to use the last of his strength to save her. It's an interesting dichotomy. Pan is important enough to rally Goku like nobody else can, and that's not nothing. But I do find it a common criticism of Dragon Ball GT that Pan, despite being perhaps the most pivotal character in the show, largely exists just to be saved. That's certainly not unique to her. It immediately reminds me of Gohan's last stands against Nappa and Rikum. But when there have been so few active female fighters in Dragon Ball, it can be especially annoying to see them not live up to the standards set by their male counterparts. And it's not just fans imagining this either. It's very much by design. There's a particularly infamous quote from the show's producer, Morishita Kozo. Pan's role was to be strong, but still lose to the enemies and then be rescued by Goku, to be a heroine who makes Goku a hero. To go off topic a bit, even the hit movie Titanic moved women, because it's a story where the heroine, now an old woman, remembers the hero. Stories where the hero rescues the heroine have a sense of security. Therefore, we created a pattern where Pan is imperiled and Goku gets mad at the enemy. I won't let you get away with this! Now, I will say, as someone who recently rewatched Titanic for the first time in a quarter of a century, while it is famously remembered that Jack sacrifices his life for Rose at the end, who rescues whom isn't nearly as one sided as Morishita is making it out to be. Aside from that, though, while his gendered descriptions of this pattern are a little. Eh, Again, this isn't all that different from how every character who isn't Goku is handled. It's a problem here, and it's a problem there. There is a reason why Rose isn't just constantly waiting around to be saved by Jack. That wouldn't make her terribly interesting. I think what rightly annoys people about this quote is that it's said in answer to the question of why Pan never becomes a Super Saiyan. Everybody else can lose just fine while still enjoying that status, but Pan can't. So while Morishita doesn't explicitly say it, it does come across like Pan can't be a Super Saiyan because she's a girl, and girls exist to be saved. Personally, I don't care whether she becomes a Super Saiyan or not. I'm kind of tired of transformations in general. I'm more interested in her being an effective character, an active character, a dynamic character who accomplishes things. Whether that requires her to change her hair color is of little consequence to me. But I do agree this is a piss-poor reason to keep it from her. As Goku is still too weak to do anything in this particular instance, Trunks follows through instead, ready to face Baby himself. And for just a second, I am thrilled. Gidu's still dead in a backpack, but at least the original trio is together again. Sadly, this does not carry for very long. Trunks is immediately beaten. There's not even a single frame of just the three of them together. Wouldn't that be nice to have just one more shot of Goku, Trunks, and Pan standing shoulder to shoulder ready to face down this enemy, as opposed to Goku yelling at them to go away because they suck? Gohan, Goten, and Kaioshin have to swoop in to save Trunks. But, you know, that direction is also okay. This has been Baby traumatizing the Saiyans, truly believing they are deserving of punishment. Now it's time for all of them to rebel against him. It's the perfect time for a mass battle where Baby's strongest servants come together to... power up Goku so he can do everything for them. Okay, fine, what else is new? It at least mirrors how they powered up Baby. 
But I've seen plenty of fans over the years who will never forgive this show simply for teasing the appearance of a grown-up Gotenks, only to never follow through with it. Baby's not going to make this wireless energy transfer easy for them, though. He doesn't consider powering up to be a free action, so he makes a ruckus to keep them all away from Goku. But it's okay because Oob is getting back into the battle as well, fighting Baby from the inside. It turns out he can do that. Somehow, for some reason. He's not going to be done in by his own Choco Beam, somehow, for some reason. In fact, he let Baby absorb him on purpose. No, no, I don't buy that. That's stupid. Look, I like the idea of Oob not being a complete waste of space. I like the emotion of all the characters coming together one by one to contribute in some way to take care of Baby. It's basically a wonderful refutation of what I was just talking about, where Goku has to save everybody. But you're asking me to shovel through an awful lot of manure to accept the situation. Seriously, Oop couldn't think of a single better time to reveal he could do this? It seems like this would have come in handy when Goku couldn't counter Baby's earlier Gyalic Ho, or when Baby was about to crush Goku just a minute ago. Why is he only here now? Well, I guess it's because the writers wrote it that way. Somehow, for some reason. Baby eventually spits Oob out, but because of the interference, Goku is able to get his ritual power transfer. Something something Super Saiyan God. I know you all want me to make the joke, so yeah. And even though Pan is not a Super Saiyan, she insists on joining the ritual too. They humor her. Aw, how cute. She thinks she's helping. So now that we're moving into the final episode of the fight, that, of course, means that it's animated by Last House. Last House. When we want our most important moments to look terrible, because life is all about balance. You know, I think this entire fight is Toei apologizing for Toriyama only letting Vegeta use the Gyalic Ho once in the original series, because Vegeta Baby uses it all the time. It was an attack that appeared so briefly that I didn't even mention it when I covered the Saiyan arc. But this garlic pun cannon is definitely making up for lost time here. See how I explained what it meant without stopping the momentum of the video to do so? Except for right now to say that I didn't? Anyway, there are a lot of Gallic Hoes. In this episode alone, we have a Super Gallic Ho and even a Rinzoku Continuous Gallic Ho. That one's a bit of a stretch as it looks nothing like a Gallic Ho. It doesn't even use the right hand motions. It's just spamming a bunch of key blasts, which is very much a Vegeta thing. It's just not that Vegeta thing. Baby launches a revenge death ball final, which I guess is different, but Goku just absorbs it. Somehow. For some reason. Eventually, Goku launches a blast. Everyone thinks he has killed Vegeta. However, he instead used it to blast off Baby's tail, which is something I'm surprised never came up before now. The Elder Kaioshin was right. Without a tail, Baby would have no weakness. That's why he transformed with one anyway. Baby panics as Vegeta's body shrinks back to its normal size. After all, Baby grew to the size of his body and he can't possibly revert back to a smaller size. That would be impossible, somehow, for some reason. Because of that, Baby is forced to finally exit Vegeta's body. Naturally, since the whole reason he left is because he was too big to fit in Vegeta's body, we now have a giant rampaging baby on our hands. Oh, wait, no, he's just a tiny blob. Somehow, for some reason. You getting tired of me saying that yet? Despite looking significantly less ugly now, Baby knows that the jig is up and flies off. Believe it or not, this is the only time we see the baby design that appears in the opening credits every week. He retreats to the spaceship Bluma has waiting for him. Just so he has one more kick the dog moment, Baby pushes her off the stairs and boards solo. Pan worries about Goku letting Baby get away, as they've done so many times before now. But thankfully, they finally learn from their mistakes. Goku waits until Baby's ship is lined up with the sun and then just blasts him into it. There are no Frieza second chances around here. He straight up pulls a Kula on Baby. Wait, is that, is that in this continuity? Maybe? People argue about this. All I'm doing is stirring the pot? I should just get out now while I still can. That's next year. I'll worry about it next year. The finale to this fight is insane. Somehow. For some reason. Actually, those reasons are pretty easy to identify. It's very satisfying, but also very stupid. 
As is so often the case, when you break these events down to their constituent elements, they're pretty awesome. Kaioshin finds an established cure for the baby eggs and goes on a quest to steal it back from the enemy. He restores all of Goku's allies. Everyone rallies around Goku to help him stop Baby. Pan and Trunks both get moments in the spotlight, reaffirming their main character status. Goku uses his wits to force Baby out of Vegeta's body. And then he finishes off the fight. That all sounds great. It is great. It's just when you dig a little deeper, you see that the return of some of those allies makes no sense, that Trunks and Pan do almost nothing, that Baby leaves Vegeta's body for no real reason. And that definitely hurts what is still, at its core, a well-paced, thematically consistent action climax. And I will give it this. It knows when to end. I know that sounds obvious, but given experiences like Future Trunks and Tournament of Power, which go on far too long and steamroll over their own perfect endings just to throw out unnecessary twists, I feel it's worth giving credit where it's due. The story does keep going at this point, but it's all stuff that obviously needs to be concluded. Characters regroup at the Heavenly Realm as the full version of the current ending song, Don't You See, plays. I point this out primarily because, unlike most Dragon Ball theme songs, the full and TV cuts are actually significantly different in their arrangements this time around, so it's nice to hear the full version. It has much stronger piano in its mix. Goku establishes not only that he can return to his regular body, he can now also transform into Super Saiyan 4 whenever he wants! I'll let that pass without a somehow for some reason tag. Kaioshin makes plans with Dende and Gohan to disperse the Cho Shinsui across Earth and Tsufuru in order to free the remaining Earthlings of their baby disease. However, the celebrations are short-lived. The second Goku says the Earth is back to normal, it begins to shake. Large fissures form in the ground. Mr. Popo immediately knows what's up. Everything has come full circle in this singular story arc. Remember those Dragon Balls that started this whole thing? Well, Goku never actually returned them to their resting place, it turns out. The characters argue over this for a bit. Goku and the others did so bring them back here. But, you know, there was that whole the characters we gave them to were actually evil and passed them to Baby instead thing that kind of interrupted the process. This is accompanied by the ugliest Dende face I've ever seen. Thanks, Last House. Pond does the math and realizes they only have two weeks left until the allotted year is passed and Earth explodes. This is also accompanied by a very ugly Pond face. Thanks, Last House. Well, it is at least nice of the Earth to give them two weeks worth of advance warning rather than everything being magically hunky-dory until the very last minute when the Earth spontaneously explodes. That hopefully alerts the heroes to any kind of brainwashing shenanigans that might have sabotaged their efforts without them realizing it. So that means the finale of the baby arc is not going to be a fight, but instead the last-ditch efforts of the heroes to save everyone on Earth. And that is something we will explore next time in the last installment of 2023's Dragon Ball Dissection December. Hey, it looks like I made good on my promise to conclude the fight in this episode. <laughs> That's a relief. I always like being a weirdo of my word. And I can now safely say that when we return on New Year's Eve for the final installment of Dragon Ball Dissection December, it will be with the conclusion to the baby arc. We'll cover the final beat of the story, and I'll get my chance to examine the arc as a whole. I love it when things come together in such a neat and tidy fashion. This is perfect. It's exactly what I hoped for. And I hope it's what you hope for, too. And don't forget that you can see that episode right now as a $10 or higher patron. There are rewards at every level, starting at $1 if you just want to support the channel and all the work I do here. If you can't do that, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, and share with your friends. Thanks so much. Merry Christmas to all of you. And as we bring 2023 to a close, I will see you next time.